Hello and happy Tuesday, everybody. It's so good to be here. So today, man, did I end up down a rabbit hole when I started prepping for this one. We are going to be talking about typesetting, probably in my world anyways, more commonly known as interior layout or interior design for your book. So when you get here, make sure you say hello, because as always, there will be prizes for those of you who have taken time out of your day to join us live. And if you're watching the replay, of course, go ahead and comment because the day of you're still entered to win our sweet book launcher swag, which of course, you know, by now, is this fabulous hashtag no boring books mug and our oh so soft journal which here it is <laughs> all right hey Vince welcome Andy John Ron woohoo I've got your book right here Ron I'm gonna be mentioning it um Angela thank you for being here and here is the oh so soft journal all right folks so this is a biggie so I'm just gonna dive right in and I think Jacqueline's gonna come on the line too who is our client care manager um, because she actually is the one that gave me a lot of these great tips and she knows a lot more about interior design uh, and layout when it when it comes to books than I do. Um, she's the one that really handles all the hiring of our professionals on our team and all those things. So um, yeah, let's just dive right in. Hey, Ben, welcome, Kevin. You stayed up for me again. Thank you. <laughs> all right, guys. Um, so first of all, <laughs> I want to kind of tie this back to um, something you guys can all relate to because for some of you, you know, I know you've been in this world for a while and you get it. But for those of us who aren't like haven't really dove into the the weeds, so to speak, of publishing your own book and, and laying it out, you might not get it. So, um, you know, if you've ever watched a movie or even like an, I've gone to short film festivals, right, where where some of the, the story is really compelling, but the way they shot the the movie is just really, really hard to watch. Maybe, <laughs> maybe the sound was bad, whatever it is, it wasn't a good experience. So even though it was probably one of the, maybe even though if it was one of the best stories you've ever heard, you still didn't enjoy it because you had a bad experience consuming that story. And that's what happens with books. And so few authors really, really appreciate this issue. And um, <laughs> this thing really jumped out at me. Last week, I was at Podcast Movement here in Los Angeles, and I was speaking with someone who has a small publishing imprint. So he publishes uh, other people's books, uh, and, and we were talking about our process, and he was just asking some questions. And uh, and I mentioned that you know we wait until we have the cover design before we start designing the interior of a book. And he asked why, <laughs> and, and I said, well, how do you make sure the same experience that somebody has when they look at the cover flows through to the interior if you don't already have that cover design? And the person was a little bit dumbfounded and kind of went, reader experience? <laughs> so uh, I was a little stunned and then I realized this is definitely something that you know I need to talk about a little bit more is that reader experience and the things that make the reader experience good beyond just the words that go on the page. There's so much that goes into this that makes a great book. Now, at Book Launchers, we're, we're pretty much self-proclaimed book nerds, so we think about reader experience all the time, and we put time and money in terms of our clients' books. So um, in that, I thought that we could chat about some of the basics and advanced tips when it comes to typesetting, which is the industry term for what happens when you do the layout and design of the interior. But typesetting is a word I don't ever use because it really comes from when people had to physically take the letters from a little box <laughs> and place it and then make the words and sentences and lock it in. Um, and fun fact for you, so this is something I learned when I was starting the company and researching all this stuff. The lowercase and uppercase naming of, you know, capital letters and and uh, and, and the not capital letters is because the, the, the capital letters, the uppercases got put into the upper box first and the, uh, the lowercase got put into the lower box or the lowercase. So there's a fun fact for you. Um, but uh, and another fun fact for you that I that I was thinking about was if you think back like on historic documents, I think like the Declaration of Independence, those were created by somebody just sitting there putting one letter at a time up. Um, and then this all changed when uh, there was the invention of the um, hot, I think it was called a hot metal type set press or something like that, where they actually got to use a keyboard, kind of like a typewriter to type out the desired text to be set. 
So that's where the word typesetting originates. That's not how I think of this, which is why it's internally at Book Watchers, we call it interior um, layout for your book. So um, I'm just going to say hello to a few more folks that have joined. So, hey, see, I told you Jacqueline was going to be here. She's the true expert here. She can correct me when I say something wrong. <laughs> And she can also answer your guys' questions if you guys have a specific interior design question. Um, and April, hello! And yes, please do like, of course, always like. And <laughs> oh, and yes, Dave, Dave's here too. Thanks, Dave. And he's commenting on the wall thing up here, um, called artistry, as he called it. And whoever hung that did a great job. Again, give you guys uh, one guess as to who <laughs> came to my office and hung that for me, right? <laughs> Uh, thanks, Ron. Great to hear. Um, all right. So if you're here, if you joined in, do say hello because we will be giving prizes. Um, Angela, at some point in the session, will pick a number and Angela will count and find that person. There's also going to be a skill testing question. And I already know what it is this time instead of trying to figure it out on the fly. Okay. Um, oh, Jacqueline. I, I just taught Jacqueline something, you guys. I'm very excited. <laughs> the origin of uppercase and lowercase, where that came from. Um, so yeah, you know, verify it, fact check it. <laughs> but I do remember learning that and being, ooh, that's cool. Um, okay, so, <laughs> so we're gonna hit on some basic tips today. Um, and, uh, and Jacqueline gave me a couple really cool ones, something I hadn't thought of. Um, but I wanna touch on the kind of the do-it-yourself side of this. There are templates that you can use for the interior design of a book. And of course, when I'm talking interior, um, like I said, I've got your book right here, Ron. So here's the Green Wizard, Ron's book. And, uh, and I'm talking the interior of the book. So the choices that go into the fonts, the margins, the typespace, the trim size of the book too. Because um, I have other books here too, like Leslie Quinze's Legacy as well. So there's, there's choices, a lot of decisions that go into designing the interior of the book, the, the reading experience, both in print, I'm holding up print books, but this also applies to the, um, there's some things I'll mention with regards to the ebook conversion as well. So anyways, um, you can use templates and, uh, <laughs> and that can work, but you'll have to correct each page manually. And as you'll, as you'll see, as I explain some of this stuff, um, you're going to get a whole new appreciation for the work and skill that goes into good interior layouts and designs because um, you have to go through and manually make choices on each line to make sure that a bunch of problems don't arise that will cause jolts for the reader in their reading experience. So a template can work, but it can still take a lot of time. Um, generally, from you know what everybody tells me, and again, I have never done this myself. I've always hired a professional because I've always just a known that I don't have the patience or the eye for detail at all to tackle something like this. But also just, I always wanted my books to look good, as good or better than a traditionally published book. So I, I had zero design experience, so I didn't want to tackle this. But I do know that a lot of authors um, use vellum. You can find it at vellum.pub. And my understanding is that, you know, if you have a fairly simple book, you can do this yourself with vellum. Um, you do need to have some patience and understand grammar rules and things like that. Um, but I have seen some good work, especially for fiction books come out of vellum. Um, but again, I'm all about not having to, to painfully go through these things myself. So I haven't done it. Uh, but I know there's some folks here that have, so if you have questions, some of them will probably answer. I think maybe Kevin has even designed some of his books himself. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> And yeah, that's a great, actually, I just saw a tip from Vince. He said, I was stumped by interior design in my first book. I went into a bookshop and picked up books that I liked the look and feel of and tried to copy that. And Derek says he made his interior. So you guys can ask him questions. <laughs> and, and you know what? Looking at other books is really important. We always ask our clients uh, when we're coming to covers and interior for preferences and styles and other books that they already like because it's great to have something to model after. Otherwise, you have an unlimited uh, number of choices. <laughs> And, and that can be a really daunting place to start. Uh, for those of you joining in, hello, welcome. Do say hello in the chat. And uh, it's great to have you here. Okay, so um, carrying on, I, I'm going to dive right into, you know, the five tips. Um, but I actually think uh, this is one of the hardest parts of the entire book production. Because um, even in the hiring side, it's been really interesting to me. Uh, because somebody with a good graphics design background 
isn't skilled enough to do this job unless they've done it many times before. And we've even hired people from magazine publishing with magazine publishing backgrounds. Um, so they get the visual experience of reading something. But there's some nuances that are very specific to books that that made, um, in many cases, um, it, it not ideal to work with them. And they found it um, very time consuming because they didn't understand some of the principles of this. Um, so it is something that is a very specific skill. Um, it is not just any graphics designer can pick up and do it. They really need to learn it and study it and, and really dive into some of these things. So so here's five tips for you, whether you're hiring somebody or you're doing it yourself, I think that these will really help you get a good solid awareness of what you need to watch out for. And the first one I actually got um, from Jacqueline, which I hadn't thought of. So it kind of, it kind of blew me away. <laughs> so number one is you can, you, you do get to choose the font, right? So the interior, the, the typeface, you know what this is called right here, you get to choose that. Um, when you do that, you want to make sure it has what's called a full package, meaning it's got italics, bold, um, italic, bold, full punctuation and symbols, you know, like the copyright symbol, all those kind of things. And the M dash, which I had to look up, you guys. I didn't know what an M dash was. And it turns out there's actually three different kinds of dashes. So now my question, my skill testing question for you guys today is, what are the three kinds of dashes? There's an M dash and then there's two others. Do you guys know what those are? <laughs> That's the skill. First person to get those three. Um, and now everybody leaves my video to go Google this, guaranteed. <laughs> Um, but anyways, a lot of fonts out there don't have the full selection of in this font package. And, and Jacqueline had kind of warned that you can get halfway through a project and realize that your font that you chose doesn't have the full package and you're missing some of the things that you need, which would be pretty upsetting to discover that halfway through a project. Um, now, the other thing is when you're choosing that font besides that package, is to really think about the reading experience because there are studies that have shown um, certain fonts are better for folks with dyslexia to read. Um, and some fonts, I've even read studies, and I'll try to find one because New York Times actually did a study on, on fonts and trust. Um, and they printed the same article in multiple different fonts and then kind of tested the believability, um, how much you believed that article. And they did find a significant difference um, in certain fonts that you actually trusted and believed what was being said um, with certain fonts more than others. So choosing that, that font is very, very important. Um, and of course, a bad font, <laughs> if anybody's ever tried to read something in, in font that was way too creative, had way too many um, doily, spinny, doodle, doodly things, <laughs> it can really ruin your reading experience. So, um, or if you've looked at a book and just kind of felt dizzy looking at that page. So font selection is really, really important for all of those reasons. Um, generally, I think a lot of the fonts that get chosen are in the Adobe packages. Um, you know, one that Jacqueline mentioned is Adobe Garamond, Garamond, however you say that. Um, so that can be a common one that's used. You can always research common fonts for you know, nonfiction or genre specific, because um, you might want to have, I, I know for a fact, um, horror books in general tend to veer towards one kind of font versus other, other kind of uh, types of books. So um, okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you, Beachside. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, so Benjamin Pres Preston. Ooh, ooh. Okay, I, I'm looking for. I, I want both. Here we go. Oh, there, Vince. Vince. <laughs> One before it changes the money. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to laugh at your pain, but here, here's the thing: is I didn't even realize they had names, right? I thought they were all just dashes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true. That's why I hire great people who know these things. <laughs> um, so yes, there you go, Pins. You are our winner. Um, I think you said you're in New Zealand. I don't know what kind of a fortune <laughs> it will cost us to send the book, uh, the Oso Soft Journal or the Mug Your Way. But shoot us an email at uh, um, book, team at bookhunters.com and you got the answer right. <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay, um, I handed Jacqueline a mess and she handed me back an incredible book everyone loves. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> um, thank you, you made it, bonjour. Uh, okay, so um, which font was trustworthy? I will find that article. And I don't think it necessarily applies direct because it was a New York Times, so I don't know if it applies direct to um, 
uh, two books. I believe for dyslexia, I think it was Sans Serif was one of the ones that was better for dyslexics to read, um, but I'm not sure. Oh, Veronica, hey, welcome. <laughs> Mike, yay, you made it. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, uh, so yeah, I'll find that article for you guys and uh, I'll try to post it down below um, in, in the comments post uh, post live and, uh, or maybe Angela's already trying to find it, but it was a New York times study that they did. And then there were some other studies that kind of came out of it, um, about that trustworthy form. Okay. Um, so number two, uh, take care of your orphans and your widows. This is something Jacqueline taught me early on again, something I did not know about. Um, so what is an orphan? Well, it's basically breaking a paragraph in the wrong place. Um, I think it actually is when the, the orphan is the one at the bottom of the page and the widow is the one at the top. So you've got a paragraph that is, you know, it's, um, the first line of the paragraph is going at the very bottom. So it's like two or three words and then it ends. So, you know, you'd be sitting here and in this page right down here, there'd be like two or three words and that's the start of the paragraph. And now you have to flip the page um, with the contrast being the widow is when the top line of the next page, the paragraph just suddenly ends, right? First line over there. Um, so, um, and just like a couple of words. I think I got those definitions right. And it's it's a jolting experience. You don't have to worry about it um, in the ebook because you it kind of flows through it. It's it's a different experience reading an ebook. But in a book, you really want to try to avoid those orphans. Um, I think it's just like one or two words. I think that's how you would categorize them. Jacqueline can clarify. Um, oh, and Jacqueline is also noting there's a specialty fonts for dyslexics where it's more weighted at the bottom. Um, okay. Um, so basically, it's really things that are left hanging because they'll mess up the experience of reading the book. Um, that's really what I'm trying to say is you kind of when you're looking at it, you just want to notice anything that just doesn't look right. Because if it just doesn't look right, the brain stops, right? You're, you get pulled out of the experience of reading and your brain's kind of going, oh, and you know, that feeling. So that's what those things are. And that's really what you're trying to avoid. And that's where a professional does that for you or they should be doing that for you. Um, number three is negative space, um, which is white space. <laughs> but of course, uh, everything seems to have its own terminology in, in this world. Um, so negative space. And you want to think about it. Um, you know, if you're not giving your book enough white space, here, I'll pull out another book for you. Um, Oscar's book. This one is, uh, we've changed the title since this one. Uh, I think it's now the A plus guide. I think we did to ban director's guide, um, a veteran band teacher's guide to teaching music. It's a very cool book. And so um, one of the things we always talk about is the feeling of the cover going to the interior. So you can kind of feel that same experience going from here. I don't know if you guys can see this very well. Um, and then into the chapter headings there. It's not like you're gonna choose a fancy font for this font here, but you still have the same feeling going through in those nice touches on the chapter heading. Anyway, when you're reading this book in a print version, you need somewhere to hold the book so your fingers aren't over the letters. So you wanna have white space in the margins. You also need to have enough white space so there's room for the binding to go without having the words too tight into the middle of the page. And of course you need space at the top for text, um, for page numbers and words. So um, you also wanna consider white space between the letters and between the words, because if there's too much text on a page, it just feels overwhelming. Um, and also, you know, not enough, not enough uh, text on a page. So too much white space can also have a feeling as well. So again, it's that experience and really judging what you wanna create for your reader. Um, those are some decisions that you might need to make when you're doing this. And, and you know, again, we have standards and recommendations, but all of our clients make different choices. So every one of our books has a slightly different feeling and different spacing, different fonts, all those kind of things. Um, number four is, I don't want you to go crazy. And this is again, Jacqueline's tip is don't go crazy and use every font available to you. Remember this as an experience for your reader. And <laughs> <laughs> I kind of giggled when Jacqueline was telling me this because I thought about my very first job out of university and it was, um, you know, email was still really new and I got this email account where I could actually put fonts um, and bold and color <laughs> and size and I'm pretty sure that some of my early emails to my boss and to my team looked like a clown had thrown up on the page because I would use all colors and highlighters 
and all these things in the emails because it was all new and so exciting. And so I think some of uh, some authors kind of get, and even um, beginner designers get like that, and they try to use all the different things. And again, that can be quite a, a traumatizing experience for a reader, a reader to have all of this stuff coming at them. So yeah, I probably owe my my boss an apology for those early emails that I sent. <laughs> Again, it's really taking little touches from the, the cover and bringing it throughout and, you know, using the tools that are at your disposal, like bolds and italics is to emphasize words and make reading easier, um, not, not trying to cram every tool, um, everything you've got into one spot. This is Yolanda AE. Welcome. Yay. Um, and Fast Company says the winner is Baskerville. <laughs> All right, that is the font winner uh, for the most the font that is most trusted. Is that correct, Kevin? Um, orphans are the starting line of a paragraph, and the rest of the paragraph is on the next page. I was right. Whew. And a widow is alone at the top. Yes. Okay, I got it. Um, so that's great. Thank you for clarifying and verifying that I was right. Um, it, oh, Angela, the t it wasn't for dyslexic friendly typesettings. It was actually a study on. Um, the font that was more likely to create trust or believability in the same article. That was the New York Times study. It wasn't a dyslexic font. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, and then, but Kevin also was Googling like crazy and found that the it was Baskerville is also the most trustworthy font. So yay. <laughs> All right. So uh, I have one more tip for you guys. And uh, in the meantime, I'm going to do another draw, and then we're going to pull a number. So if you're here and haven't said hello yet, now's your chance. Okay, so this is for the draw um, for commenters. So when you comment the day a video is released, you'll be entered to win our famous hashtag no boring books mug right here, or our oh so soft journal. When you win today, you just need to email us at team, T-E-A-M, at booklaunchers.com. And uh, of course, we'll need your mailing address and your choice. And then Angela will make sure you get your prize um, sent to you. So uh, let's see who today, we're going to do two of these. We're going to do two. So our first winner today is none other than <gasps> Poetry from the Heart. <laughs> I don't know how many times Poetry from the Heart has won. It's like there's people like Studio 38 who work really hard to get a victory and <laughs> have not yet won, but your time is coming, I'm sure of it. Okay, um, oh goodness, Alan, I didn't know you were in Tokyo. Are you always in Tokyo? <laughs> Or are you just traveling there right now? Anyways, um, hello and welcome. That's a that's quite a time zone difference, I can't even do the math. All right, uh, cool. Okay, so I'm going to go back and um, while I'm over here, Let's do, what's the date today? We are the 19th. All right, so Angela, let's go from Jacqueline's, or no, actually from Kevin's comment where he says, Fast Company says the winner is Baskerville. Go forward 19, because today is, no it's not, today's February 18th, go forward 18th. <laughs> Thank you, I just realized that. <laughs> At least I knew today was Tuesday, winning. <laughs> I know I thought that too I yeah so you're you are in Tokyo wow I didn't know that that's very cool okay I learned something new every every day oh and Benjamin's in DC yay we have another client in uh in and around the DC area now too um, um he's not on the live stream <laughs> today but uh but he's he's near you Ben so that's kind of cool okay um yeah I know I figured out it's the 18th thanks everybody <laughs> So Angela's going to figure out the winner. <laughs> Angela's also located in Texas. Uh, so there you go. Okay. So the final tip that I have for you is number five. Um, and it's actually something we do to test out our designers um, once we go through in our hiring process. Um, so, but before I tell you what that test is, because you can use it too in a different version, um, it, it really comes down to the ebook conversion because uh, a lot of people think that you can just take the file and convert it into, uh, you know, the flow through document. But um, ebooks are actually really kind of a, a fascinating thing because you can make the fonts bigger. You know, you can read it on a mobile device in this size, or you can read it on a on a like a 
a reading device. Um, Angela has a new one that she's super excited about. I can't remember which one you got, the Kobo. I think she got the Kobo, um, the latest Kobo uh, reading device, ebook reader. So um, everybody reads the ebooks in a different way uh, and, and has a different preference for how they read them. So you have to create that flow through. But if you try to just straight up convert a document, it doesn't have the flow that it needs to have. And so the experience is jarring. And I actually bought um, a children's book on a Kindle. And it, you know, it was a Kindle book, so it was for sale on a Kindle. But I was trying to read it, and it wasn't a Kindle friendly, or it wasn't a mobile friendly document. So clearly, it had just tried to do some sort of a conversion. So we couldn't actually, like, you couldn't actually see the pages on the, the Kindle device. So um, it's really, it's really more complicated than people think. So um, what we do is we uh, we actually ask for the um, the in design files from our designers uh, that we're potentially hiring because, and some of them are kind of like, why are you asking for this? You want to steal my template? <laughs> and again, a template does not solve anything. So we're definitely not interested in their template. <laughs> what we're interested in is whether they are setting themselves up for ebook conversion success or not. Um, and and in the words of Jacqueline, <laughs> who is the one that does all of this, again, I can't emphasize that enough. I am not the expert. Um, she and her team are the expert. But the big thing is that she's looking at to see if the designers have used paragraph styles, character styles, and master pages, um, because if they know those features, they're going to save a lot of time when when they go to export it into that flow um, that flow through uh, ebook. So. Um, and there's also scripts that you can do um, in Adobe InDesign that will make your task as a designer easier for these things that you're doing over and over. So from a hiring perspective, if you're like me and you don't have InDesign, don't know what you're looking for, you probably aren't going to ask for an InDesign file because, again, I go, Jacqueline, hey, what do you think of this file? <laughs> but, uh, but what you can do is, first of all, ask to see it in a PDF so you can see that you like their design choices. And I would ask to see multiple books. Um, but the other thing is you can just ask them, hey, listen, how do you set yourself up so that you're going to have an easier time converting it to ebook and see what they say? Um, and this is where we find that you know the graphics designers that have a great eye for graphics designer design, but they haven't done this, this is where they fall down. This is also where they get frustrated working with us because they don't have those systems, those scripts in place. They haven't done these, these steps that make the ebook conversion so much easier for themselves. Um, so then they get frustrated with our timelines, whereas our designers that are experienced at this, they already do this and they've got scripts for the things they're doing over and over again. Um, and, you know, the process actually goes fairly quickly for them. Um, so th that's really, that's the big... The big tip. And, you know, you may not know a lot of these details, and I certainly didn't before I started book launchers, and I still managed to self-publish a couple of books, but again, I hired professionals. Um, and I think really what I did is something you can do too, is you can just look at that at that you know preview file and go like does this look professional or amateur you'll have a real good gut feeling for that and you'll also have a sense of things that you may not know the names for like um what do you call it i think they the technical term and again jacqueline can you know tell me or not is as a word stack so in a in in a book if you open it up and there's actually the same word somehow manages to fall on top of each other uh it works, it's a word stack. And again, it's like a visual mind game that can pull a reader out of the experience. Um, you may not know what that's called, but you will go, oh, that looks weird. So looking for things like that and kind of paying attention to your gut instinct, um, kind of like those M dashes. But that's really, uh, you know, an M <laughs> And again, the M dash is, is like a punctuation mark that can take the place of a comma and a parenthesis. And I, I use them all the time and I didn't know what they were called. But your designer needs to know where these are appropriate and where they're not. So there's almost some grammar um, work to this, this job. And that's, again, why you have to go line by line by line, which is why it's a detail work. Um, and it takes a lot more effort and, and uh, patience. <laughs> <laughs> and and technique and expertise than you guys might think. So again, that's why I hire professionals and why I have an awesome team that knows all this stuff. But I thought that a lot of these things would help you whether you're doing it yourself or you're hiring designers. Okay, um, Alan West. <laughs> we are going international today. I think we're going to New Zealand and Tokyo if I'm reading this right. <laughs> okay, um, it was a Kobo, cool. 
um, ebooks are laid out properly can be reflowable based on the reader's preference. Exactly. Yes, yeah. You know, it took me probably five minutes to say that. So thanks, Jacqueline. <laughs> Basically, anyone can make a PDF look good, but the InDesign source file will show whether they have a fundamental understanding of the program um, and are thinking on the next step, which is the ebook expert. Thank you. Um, Kevin uses Affinity Publisher, Designer, and Photo, but Vellum formats all my books. So I use Publisher for low content, which is nice. So that's cool. Thanks for sharing that, Kevin. Um, a word stack is when two or more lines have the same word directly above or below. See, I kind of said that. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> There's also something which I don't really see ever, um, but I read about it uh, actually just kind of reading some tips today and it was called rags. And I guess that's where words get all raggedy on the right side. But most of the books I went through and just checked, we, you know, they all get spaced right across like that. Right. So I don't know what that's called either. <laughs> That's why Jacqueline's here. All right, let's do our final draw of the day. So far, we have uh, three winners. We have Poetry from the Heart, Alan West, and Victor. Victor, I've just forgotten your last name. <laughs> or Vince. Was it Vince? Vince won? Yeah, Vince. Vince Warnock. Not Victor. Sorry. Okay. Um, it's like live. It's like doing math live. I don't ever try to do that. Okay, so my other, my final YouTube commenter winner of the day is da 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 see, what do we have? Mike Hurd! Yay! Congratulations! <laughs> All right, and we got England. There's like nobody in the States today. <laughs> you guys are really challenging my shipping budgets. Okay, so send us an email at team at booklaunchers.com with your choice of what you want and where we should be sending it, and Angela will get that off to you. All right, so thank you guys so much. Um, if you guys have a suggestion for a future topic for our next live stream, which will be happening in two weeks, let me know and I would love to hear it. And thank you to everyone for joining today. And yeah, Guy said, I've learned book, book jargon. We justify, I hate ragged edges. <laughs> justify, that's the word I was looking for. Thank you, Jacqueline. All right, so it's email your winner, um, email your victory into team at bookwatchers.com. And again, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, it was fun to hang out with you and I can't wait to see you guys again in two weeks.